Welcome to Poetry Club. Today we are reading poems by Rena Priest, Washington State's new poet laureate. Grab a cup of coffee, some juice, or your favorite beverage, and join us for another great conversation. Mike Googled the the guy who flew in his lawn chair. And <laughs> the accurate figure, I didn't make up the figure I gave, but Mike says he, he only went to 16,000 feet. Oh. <laughs> I like 30,000. That was more exciting. Well, it makes twice as good a story. Well, yeah. the name of the guy is Larry the Lawn Chair. I mean, that's his nickname. So Forever. it'll be his name now. Yeah. <laughs> You'll never get away from that. Oh, the other part of the fun part of that was he was, um, he brought up with him a pellet gun to shoot the balloons to eventually, uh, so that he would I'm descend. Nice. Um, he brought up some cold cut sandwiches. So, you know, in case he got hungry and okay. then the, the best thing he brought up there with him was some Miller light. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That was to stay calm, help him stay calm. <laughs> to have all the basic food groups. Yeah. A bologna sandwich and a Miller Lite. Yeah, and a 16,000 foot view. <laughs> yeah, he wanted to be a light. Yeah, they need to work on that. <laughs> he said he thought he was going to plateau out at about 100 feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a fun story. <laughs> that was an idea that went wrong, wasn't it? Mm. <laughs> All right. I like that he was prepared, though. Yeah. <laughs> sort of. Sort of, yeah. Prepared against getting hungry. <laughs> Let's learn something about the poems. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm learning that it, you know, when we come 30 minutes early, yeah. we're still talking 15 <laughs> minutes into it. Well, rescue us, rescue us, Ron. Well, I enjoyed these poems. Yes. Also, Shannon, I liked, and Mike, I liked the introduction that you put together. That was fun. <laughs> we made ourselves do it. We talked Good. about it long enough. And we're just like, let's yeah. do it. Yeah, like, that's what right. you're doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it could always be changed if you, mm -hmm. if you want to. Yeah. I, I liked it. Oh, Good. We will continue to do it. We will continue to do it then. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, we'll continue to do it. And Ron, do you want to head us off to a tour of a salmonberry and Rena Priest? We ready to start? The, the Prince of Segway. <laughs> Thank you. The Prince of Segway. <laughs> yes. Uh, Push the button. Yeah, there's, I'll be happy to. I, I'll, there was a wonderful article in the Seattle Times, a full page, uh, the day, I think, after she was, Rena was appointed Poet Laureate. It's wonderful to have a person in our area and someone who is a member of the uh, Lummi, Lummi Reservation. So she was raised on the Lummi Re Reservation, attended Western Washington University where she started out teaching theater and then realized that she really wasn't into theater, took Jim Berlino's poetry course mm -hmm. and became a convert. And when she decided she was going to get a degree in creative writing, I'm sure none of the rest of us heard this question, but people would ask what I was going to do with that degree. She said she would defend it. It's not just creative writing. And then she said someone in graduate school uh, told her, shared with her Shelley, Percy Shelley's quote, uh, poets are the unacknowledged legislators for mankind. And she thought she had her rationale. <laughs> After she left Western, graduated from Western, she went to New York, got a degree in uh, writing with a focus on poetry from Sarah Lawrence College and kind of felt she had to deal with some personal issues. So she 
she stopped writing uh, and started working at a uh, a video shop called Film is Truth, where she met a woman. Mm. You all may know the name, Dee Dee Chapman. It was a new name to me. And Dee Dee, who worked at the store, was an organizer, an MC. You'll love this for a, sm- a monthly poetry event called Kitchen Sessions. And she invited Rena to attend. And Rena says, I started going to this reading and found an amazing community of writers uh, that really helped uh, me reintegrate poetry back into myself. Uh, So her first book, Patriarchy Blues, uh, won the, uh, what do I want to say, the National Book Award. Uh, And that was 2018. And a year later, she published her second book, uh, Sublime Subliminal. I'll say a few words. I'll come back to those uh, in in a couple of minutes, but I'll say a couple words about the Poet Laureate (coughs) uh, appointment. The Humanities Washington CEO is Julie Ziegler, and she, (coughs) she said the position of Poet Laureate in our state is much more than ceremonial. It's a dedicated outreach position where you meet with thousands of people each year using poetry and language as a starting point for connection. And I thought, I I think I've read something like that before, but it was interesting to read that that's deliberate and partly how they choose people. And I remember when I, I interviewed Todd Marshall that he had submitted an application uh, as Rena did, talking about the projects that he would conduct. The panel was in, as uh, the Arts Washington Executive Director, Karen Hannon, says about Rena's uh, choice, the choice of Rena. The panel was impressed by Rena's skill and compelling nature of her poetry and work. She was also chosen for the depth and breadth of her connections to communities and her capacity to further extend those connections through her role as State Poet Laureate. <clears throat> when I read her poetry, I, I was impressed after I did some of this reading with the quality of the poetry and then her seriousness as an activist, uh, which she talks about. So Rena's own intentions, uh, she, in her words, my focus in, the, in this role is going to be on visiting tribes bringing poetry out into the natural world to celebrate beautiful places in Washington and writing poems based on ecology and environmental uh, restoration and preservation. Uh, She says there are 29 federally recognized tribes in Washington composed of 140,000 tribal citizens. And Rena says, I'm sad to say that in the hundreds of poetry readings I've attended over the years, I've only met a handful of native poets. I know that this is not because we don't exist, but because we don't have the same access to writing communities as people living in cities and towns. And so she is really serious about (coughs) engaging the tribal communities. Uh, For the environmental piece, she says she hopes to use poetry and story to invite readers to engage in contemplation of how they can help protect the natural world. She's won many uh, awards in addition to the uh, American Book Award. Uh, She received the Allied Arts Foundation 2020 Professional Poets Award, a 2020 Vedan Foundation Fellowship, Residency Fellowships (coughs) International. (coughs) She's a National Geographic Explorer and a 2019 Jack Straw writer, as we know. (laughs) We know Uh, that. She's taught comparative cultural studies and contemporary American issues of Western and Native American literature at Northwest Indian College. Uh, I like this summation of the themes in her works and it'd be interesting for us to apply these as we look at her poems. While her first book, which was Patriarchy Blues, was informed by the culture of 
toxic masculinity so prevalent in New York City. The second was inspired by reviving and reinventing herself. Uh, and her, her newest work reflects Washington's national, natural beauty and her tribal language in indigenous identity. I've come into a space where I want to write about and explain a different worldview. And there was just this wonderful little nugget that I found in one of her interviews. God, she's, she conducts, she gives great answers, uh, really revealing herself in, in interviews. There's an interview uh, mm. at the, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, crap. I'll find it and talk about it again. But at the, the place where she had the uh, internship in in Britain, uh, that's about seven pages long, and I'm gonna I'll ask Mike to distribute it the, the link because I, I think we'll come back to her poetry next week uh, so that you can read uh, the interview. But she, once she finds time, she says she still indulges in her love for the local terrain. I like the trail to Boulevard Park <laughs> and really like Watcom Falls a lot. <clears throat> but when I'm at a loss for something to do, think about what you all default to when you're at a loss for something to do. She says the default is to go to Lafine's and get a donut. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also <laughs> love a spot on the res, but I'm not going to tell you where. I'm keeping that one a secret. <laughs> Everything, every website has these lovely photographs of her, and she is just perpetually smiling. And one of the questions in the, it was the Mineral College interview that I was trying to think of. One of the questions uh, <clears throat> was, you write sad poetry, but you're such a person of, of joy. And her answer to that question is just delightful. And you know, we can look at it as we look at the poems. That's my intro. <laughs> Thank you uh, for sending along the link to Passing the Laurel. Um, I I didn't watch I didn't watch the whole hour and a half, but I skipped ahead and and heard her read and and discuss. And I thought she was so charming. I watched every minute of it, and it the poem that I've written for today I wrote as I was watching it because mm -hmm. I was so caught up in that going home longing for for the the river that's already gone by oh. and it just I thought it was absolutely beautiful I would not have missed a minute of it I hope everybody watched it and I hope if you haven't watched it that you will because I think it does two things one it honors librarians <laughs> and their um importance to the poet laureate experience and then it also um is steeped in native tradition and the lummy tradition and is so full of hope and love and respect and it's all the things we would love to hear <laughs> if we're on a big journey and making a sacrifice to serve a cause of poetry and to think that she did that after the week or two of non-stop interviews <laughs> shows the strength uh, uh, and the depth to Rena Priest. I watched it for the second time today and I felt so enriched once again <clears throat> by, by seeing it. So I urge you, <laughs> urge you to see it. <clears throat> well, is there a poem anyone would like to take first? I like um, daffodils. Let's do it. You want me to do it? All right. You want to read it? I can read it unless somebody else wants to. Oh. 
No, that's fine. All right. I've been <laughs> practicing. <laughs> Daffodils, after Wordsworth. The indigenous poet writes life-affirming poems about daffodils. Her audience says, but you're oppressed. The indigenous poet writes poems of outrage about oppression. Nobody cares. She gets depressed. The indigenous poet gets requests for poems about being indigenous. But all my poems are about being indigenous. The indigenous poet isn't considered an indigenous poet. Because shouldn't you write about genocide? The indigenous poet tries to write poems about genocide. Her poet spirit dies. Genocide gets the job done. The indigenous poet says, Stang si tim ex willa, and writes about daffodils <clears throat> and the untouchable beauty of living a poet's life. What the hail? This is as close as we get to a swear word in Exwilini chosen Lummi language. Yeah, that's our note. Interesting. What the hell? I like that. It's mm. very Washingtonian, I think, as well. <laughs> <laughs> our weather. Well, I, I think part of the reason I liked this poem was um, just seeing her and listening to her reader poems. As Ron mentioned, all of the pictures and all of her her persona is just she's smiling and she has this um, infectious personality of positivity and spirit, just a good spirit. So I, then I read this poem and I, I see that it's not something that it's something that she does have to work at i mean there's a lot of layers um for her to work through so like the way that she starts out with the indigenous poet and kind of explores the different facets that other people expect of her but then she she in the end i don't know if it closes as well but i think in the end she we know that she figures it out because she's washington state's poet laureate <laughs> we, know, we know we know how it ends I like the way she tries on the roles. She kind of evolves toward a poetic identity in mm -hmm. the poem. And by trying on the expectation, trying to fill the roles that other people have declared for her. It seems to me that the, a key line uh, is the second to the last and the untouchable beauty. Uh, I, that, uh, that's, to me, that's the, to me, that's the answer to this equation that's being presented. She finally says, uh, I have to just be me and not what someone wants, not the version someone thinks I should be. I, yeah. I think it is, it must be such a struggle for any any person outside kind of the, 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 the white mainstream, the pressure that they have to be speaking for their group. Um, I noted several people right after the, the, the time in the last month when there was so much uh, violence against Asian, um, Asian Americans or the Pacific Islanders. And so many of the people writing said, I can't tell you what everybody feels about this. I can tell you what I feel, but I can't tell you what everybody feels. Yeah. And that's my <clears throat> sense here. You know, I I can't be I can't be the Indian who's going to explain genocide to you or uh to to make you feel how it feels to be oppressed. Mm. Well, and that insistence throughout the poem, or you know, at least the repetition of the the phrase "the indigenous poet," uh, she's supposedly representative, but she's herself one mm -hmm. in the final analysis. <clears throat> so the resistance of the label. Hmm? What, uh, yeah, I'm sure she will be 
I, I like what you said about her projects during the year and her her wanting to be with the tribes, but she wasn't appointed the indigenous poet laureate of the state. She's the poet laureate. And I, I think she's reminding us here that that's who she is. She's the poet. Mm -hmm. Who happens to be Lummy? Yeah. Proudly so. <laughs> I appreciate, uh, I, I get a kick out of this as a strong a, a curse as you can get uh, in the, the <laughs> Lummi language. But so I appreciate, though, that reference to the language and others. So I thought it was really interesting when I listened to her yesterday, her discussion, her sadness that she doesn't know her language and that she's working hard to learn it now. Mm -hmm. but, but how she got. And then I got a whole different feeling about that when the elders explained to her and to the other children that we don't want you to be set aside as we are. We were because we spoke no English. I think she was talking, saying a quote, but I'm not sure if it was her mind who generated these words or someone told them to her. But if you do not know the language, you cannot talk to yourself is hmm. one of the most profound statements and i i've added it to my poem because it's right there with heracles i mean it is to me i think it's that profound that it's that's so true she said that she feels that naming it through poetry was what she could do Be she spent her life with words because as she said our mother tongue is how we understand ourselves our innermost self. And there's a lot of people who do not get to learn their mother tongue mm -hmm. when they come to a, a melting pot USA. They're encouraged to, uh, to learn the language of English and let the other language go. And with, of course, the uh, Native Americans, it was quite profound. And she says she poetry was her substitute. And now she's going back to learn the language. And they were telling her during the ceremony, it's not your fault that you don't know the language. It's nobody's fault. Yes. It, and I thought that that attitude about there's there's no blame here. It is, you know. And then she said um, uh, something about... Um, Without trees, we can't have democracy. And I thought that was brilliant. I just, that's how she's going to marry the two, right? The environmental with um, her holding up the spirit and inspiration of Native Americans mm -hmm. is to remind people ecologically, this is our moment. And without trees, we cannot have democracy. This poem, like a lot of her, her poems that I read, is very has a broad range of tonal elements and a mixture of tone. It's really hard to say that this is the tone of the poem. And there's a a, a woman, Riza Denenberg, uh, did a review for, uh, for the Poetry Cafe. Uh, a review of Sublime Subliminal, and one of her comments, I think, is true about almost all the poems that we have. She says, each of the poems in the book is at once partly amusing, partly ironic, partly musical, and partly a deep reflection on the current state of the world. Mm -hmm. That's a r really wonderful appreciation, I think, of just the range of tone. Yeah, wouldn't we all love to have that said about our poetry? <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have to read the tour of Salmonberry uh, after this. Okay. You want to read it, Shannon? Sure. I did not, um, unlike Mike, I did not practice. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> a tour of a salmon berry. A salmon berry is a luminous spiral, a golden ba basket woven of sunshine, water, and bird song. I'm told that the birds sing so sweet because of all the berries they eat. And that is how you can have a sweet voice too. In my native language, the word for salmon berry is uh, ali, ali, alili. In Sanskrit, lila means God plays. Salmon berries sometimes look that way. Every year they debut spectacular in the landscape, worthy of their genus name, uh, Rebus spectapolis, meaning red sight worth seeing. <laughs> Each druplet holds a seed and a shimmering secret kept by rain of how to rise, float above the earth, feel the sun, and return. I think I destroyed the Latin on that. Rubus spectacle, obviously spectacle, spectacular. <laughs> oh, goodness. I didn't look up druplet, although I meant to. What does that word mean? It's a small fruit that contains a seed, like a Logan berry or black a salmon berry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it is just a just a descriptor of that kind of berry. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice word, isn't it? Yeah. It is. I at first thought it was a typo. I thought it was trying to be a droplet, um, but it, it's a it's a great word. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if you all have ever been out salmon berry picking, but this is not a good description of salmon berry picking. In my opinion, there's three salmon berries on one great big bush, and you are going forever to get enough to have any of them to eat. So <laughs> the world has changed in the world that I've looked for salmon berries, or this is not a very representative poem. Mm. I notice uh, that they are well eaten uh, on the trails if they're hanging out right next to a trail as soon as they come in uh, if you see salmon berries on a popular trail and nobody's eaten them yet that's you're pretty lucky <laughs> it, it's a poem and, and she comes very close to writing an ode to the salmon berry <laughs> it's a definitely a poem of praise and I really like the way the stanzas, you know, so many of her poems have their own, they're, they're kind of regular in form, but each stanza takes up a separate issue and really explores it nicely. I'm going to say this very cautiously because I, I needed to, uh, I haven't, um, check this out recently but i think lila means god's play is the lila is the name of her daughter and that's why i say it cautiously because i'm i'm not quite sure of that but that's my belief mm -hmm. you know i so, the I end of that third stanza uh all the claims that might be made about nature and spirituality and so on how understated that last line is. In Sanskrit, Lila means God plays. Salmon berries sometimes look that way. What a wonderful <laughs> understatement. And then I think it, she comes back to that in the last stanza where she says, each driplet holds a seed in the shimmering secret kept by rain of how to rise, float above the earth, feel the sun, and return. But she's yeah. talking transcendence there, is she not? And that's part of the tool, tour. Especially if that is, is a poem that she's bringing her daughter into. And again, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't say for sure, but I believe that's an accurate. Are you you're talking about, yeah. Betty, I may have missed 
uh, this in what you said, the, con the con connectivity that she's talking about in that poem, the conversation with her daughter? I believe her daughter's <laughs> named Lila. Oh, now I got it. Yeah. All right. I think. Apologies to Rena if I'm wrong, but I think that's true. Hmm. I, yeah. I, I do love I love the lines that Ron pointed out. Um, God plays. Sam and Barry sometimes look that way. Uh, that they're at play. I I just think that's despite Lynn saying that they're devious and they hide and there aren't very many of them. Maybe that's their play. Maybe that's the play. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're precious because they're so few. Mm -hmm. They're like gold. Yeah. I, I, well, I always like the concept when I see it that God takes pleasure in in God's creation. No, God, that just makes it sound like God likes salmon, salmon berries. Um, I was rereading it, rereading it. The highest form of spirituality, so. Um, I was rereading again the quote from The Color Purple, where Suge is saying, God is pissed when we don't notice the color purple. <laughs> created it and just annoyed if we don't see it. So here, look at the salmon berry, folks. It's an, it's an interesting extension of the claim in Genesis that God looked upon his creation and saw that it was good. It was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything more on this poem? It's got such a nice Lovely. pace to it. Uh, she has her own really powerful romantics view of nature. And I'd really like to read you the pas passage from her interview with the mineral uh, school. Mm -hmm. The question is, Rena, you are an incredibly joyful person who also writes uh, uh, sad things. It's a longer question, but she, Rena then says, I would say I find joy in noticing the world, deeply noticing it, and just going along in awe at in awe at all of its minute and grand magnificence. I also find incredible joy in poets and artists and musicians who share their deep noticing of the world through their work. I feel like this has been my experience. <clears throat> it brings me great joy when I can sit still enough for long enough to let that ecstatic world in. In that state, you can fall in love with the trajectory of a dust particle or the reassuring mm -hmm. creak of your neighbor's footsteps upstairs. <laughs> and yep. for her, yes. all of this, this uh, noticing nature is of a piece with her activism. She says, part of deeply noticing the world is noticing injustice. And then part of deeply noticing it is feeling the sting of it. And once it's felt, it's harder to turn away from it. So you bear witness or speak to the difficult questions raised in you by what you've observed in some aspect of life. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, it's what, really powerful. It's what you, uh, to me, that's a typical poet. And where I think some of the best work gets written is in that state she describes. And that's my opinion. But, uh, I, well, um, Shannon, I was thinking just as soon as um, Ron read that, and, uh, that's Shannon's work, and Le that's Lynn's work. I think you both accomplished that through your, uh, with your focus to details. Well, I don't know if this is setting up a straw person, <clears throat> but I think people who dismiss poetry as just kind of nature worship fail to see the profundity of that connection and of those insights about how the world, the spirit in the world and how the spirit becomes violated by injustice. Mm -hmm. 
So I think the poem that could follow is the frolicsome crest and glistening when we're through discussing <laughs> the, uh, the salmon berry. Well, they Go seem to be it. building on each other too. So yeah. it doesn't mean we were, we're gone from one and we may go back. What, what title did you say? The Frolicsome Crest and Glistening. Read it. What is it then between us, Walt Whitman? There are 20 million pounds of gold suspended in normal seawater spread out in parts per trillion. Gold is good conductor of electricity, but seeing how it's sought, I'll bet it's the best conductor of a heart's deepest want. I once had a conversation with my daughter in which she asked, do you believe everything is connected? That depends, I said. On what, she asked. On whether you're being spiritual or, conspir or conspiratorial. <laughs> Spiritual, she said. Then yes, I said, everything is connected. How can everything be connected spiritually, but not conspiratorially, she asked. Mm -hmm. Considering it, I believe the spirit conspires against our errant belief that we are separate. I might be you, you might be me. We might be the living sea with 20 million pounds of gold shimmering suspended between us, conducting our heart's deepest wants across frolicsome crests and glistening. And what else could it be if not a spiritual conspiracy? <laughs> Can't help but smile at that one. I know, right? got the biggest smile on his face right now. <laughs> There's a pretty profound set of philosophic tenets buried, buried there and in all layers of the poem. I yeah. like how, how she gets at it with that pretty authentic conversation between the mother and daughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just walked in the door and I had left my computer on and I heard Betty's voice reading the poem and uh, it was it was refreshing I I thought I forgot for a moment what it was and then I remembered the poem so you read it very well yes good job Betty <laughs> I don't think this is pressing a point but look at the line that follows that little exchange consider it considering it i believe the spirit conspires and conspiring is almost an inversion of spirit mm -hmm. i find the word conspiratorially one that we would all have difficulty and i have to think it through as i say it mm -hmm. as kind of needlessly complex there's an overlay of it and it, i think it's kind of an apt word for that context. Mm -hmm. I agree with Emery that it, that vocally it would make, and Ron <clears throat> it would make you stumble, but I think reading it and seeing the relationships to the root words that are used, uh, I think is quite clever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like it. When you read it, you're, your internal dialogue, your your mind when you're reading it, there is you actually notice your eyeball, you know, your eyes notice um, there's a kind of a play on words here, um, and it it flows when you read it in your mind. I think those two lines that I just read, considering it, I believe the spirit conspires against our errant belief that we are separate. In her interviews, I think she doesn't point to those specific lines, but she would say that is a central issue in her poetry, mm. is discovering about ourselves, especially as we seek identity, that we are part, 
of everything and not separate from everything. And it's learning then how to uh, give assent uh, to that in our lives. That is the joy in living. Mm. Mm. Please don't tell me I'm a part of Trump. (laughs) (laughs) Genetically. (laughs) Who let that word T word in this conversation? Well, his greatest sin is that he's so separate from everything. Yeah. (laughs) And he's created division. Mm. (laughs) That's great. So, Shannon, I guess guess we'll come back to her next week. You know her. Mm -hmm. uh, And I admire your reticence in not revealing a lot of what you know but i'd love to hear from you some thoughts about uh this person this writer and you you probably heard her poetry over the years oh yeah anyone who attends open mics uh because she uh it sounds like she she came to bellingham what 2017 yeah uh something like that and uh when she, for her to get plugged into with um with Dee Dee, um, that was just the right place to go. Uh, Kitchen Sessions is amazing. I think you've been there, haven't you, Betty? Kitchen uh, se- I know Dee Dee, but I'm not sure I've done Kitchen Sessions. Oh. By the way, Rena um, went to Green's Corner, a variety of different things, and she has written the blurb for my next book on the back cover. Whoa. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, oh, my son is laureate. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So we go way back, actually, um, Rena and I. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's very active. May in I the- touch you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rena's perfect for this position. Uh, so she has a wonderful reputation in Bellingham. I don't know anyone who doesn't like her. Um, and she knows everybody. She may, she She's very smart. Um, she doesn't make enemies. I think most of us are pretty, <laughs> pretty laid back and just doing, sharing our stuff, you know, and we're pretty supportive of each other. Like I said, there's nobody, I, I don't know anyone who doesn't like her. She's, she's just an amazing person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, should we come back to her poems next week, folks? Do you want sure, to keep there, talking about them today? Yeah, there are several more I'd like. Yeah, I guess to I, do, so. Good. I'd like to, well, we've got a, a few more to look at next week, but that little five-line poem, uh, The Perils of Flight, I just thought was a, a wonderful poem, and, and, and along the others, so good. <laughs>